from there himself, since you know he knows more about himself than I do, which is hard to imagine. Bob Morrison is an associate professor of, of psychology and neuroscience at Loyola University Chicago. He and his research collaborators use behavioral, behavioral, computational, neuroimaging, and most recently brain stimulation methods to investigate topics such as memory, reasoning, creativity, and general open-mindedness. He's done this with participants ranging, ranging from 30, sorry, from three to 90 years of age. Bob received his BS in chemistry from Wheaton College prior to studying visual art at the Cleveland Institute of Art. While working as an artist, Morrison became fascinated with the science behind creativity. He pursued this interest studying visual mental imagery at Cleveland State University prior to receiving his PhD in cognitive neuroscience from the University of California, Los Angeles, working with Keith Holyoke. After co-founding art science education nonprofit Zunasis with theater director and professor Chad Eric Bergman, he completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Northwestern University. Morrison joined the Department of Psychology and the Neuroscience Institute at Loyola in 2009. He now splits his time there between research, teaching neuroscience and psychology courses, and serving as undergraduate program director for Loyola's 2000 psychology and neuroscience students. Morrison has published, published numerous scientific articles and chapters and has edited the Cambridge and Oxford handbooks of thinking and reasoning. His research has been funded by several government agencies and private foundations. As a professor at Loyola, Dr. Morrison enjoys his time in the classroom and lab where he has taught and mentored many talented students. At Loyola, he received the Sujak Award for Teaching Excellence and the Langerbach Award for Undergraduate Research Mentoring. In a parallel career as an artist, he's exhibited his painting, sculpture, and photography in galleries and museums throughout the United States. He is also a trained yoga teacher and enjoys collecting and listening to music, making and drinking cocktails and gardening with his wife, Michelle. So thanks very much for being with us today. Dr. Morrison, take it away. I believe I uh, met Dr. Litwicky uh, drinking cocktails, uh, if the truth be known. Yeah, it was, uh, it was outside of business hours though. <laughs> Um, well, it's uh, a pleasure to be here with you uh, today. Let me see. I'm going to make my face less big on your screen by hopefully sharing my slides. You managed to do it before. There it is. There we go. All right, now let me get you guys back where I can see you. So uh, I think Mark asked me to talk about this. Uh, it was a, uh, a topic that was uh, is interesting to me because I've experimented with a bunch of different things in the different classes that I've uh, taught. But also most recently, I've been working with uh, a group of researchers who would like to find a better way to do college admissions that is not so uh, terribly classist, racist, et cetera, um, than uh, things like the SAT and ACT. Um, and so I started diving deep into uh, what we know about um, diversity. Um, I'm not going to talk about that project uh, on uh, admissions today, but rather I'm going to kind of talk about things that I've done in the classroom in building assignments that try to make it easier for students um, to engage with material that might have come as quite unfamiliar initially. Oops, and I already can't use my slides. Okay. Uh, so if we could take a minute, and i just like to hear a little bit about who is here. So if you could just in the chat, just tell me, uh, give me a broad stroke, couple words, what you teach at Morton.
Okay, nice, uh, nice selection of different uh, uh, expertise. Um, and then the second thing I'll ask is uh, just name one hobby that you enjoy outside of Morton. Ah, yes, fellow gardeners and fellow music people. Cool. So um, I'm, I'll keep those things in mind, hopefully, uh, particularly during the discussion afterwards. Um, but I'm just going to start with just a little bit of theory. Um, and this is a model which I've kind of adapted from uh, Howard Gardner of Multiple Intelligences fame, uh, Mike Csikszentmihalyi, who is made me most famous for the th theory of flow, uh, and Michael Feldman, who's a developmental psychologist. And they built this model originally to talk about uh, creativity. And so it's a version of which I use in my psychology of creativity class. Uh, oh, you know what? I think we missed my slide. I'm sorry. I'm going to go back and just say this first. Mark hit a lot of this because he read a bio, but just to give you an idea. So my job is like a third, a third, a third from all practical uh, perspectives, just so you know where I come from. So I, I run a lab with about 13 or 14 uh, students in it. Um, we do uh, mainly EEG and brain stimulation, studying uh, reasoning. Right now, mainly reasoning, creativity, and open-mindedness. Um, so we test uh, models of cognitive neuroscience about those things using um, those methods. And we do things like write papers and go to conferences and uh, things like that. Um, and on the teaching front, just so you know where I come from. Uh, I, I was brought to Loyola originally to start a neuroscience major. Um, and that's part of those 2000. So it's like I have about 1300 psychology majors and 600 uh, neuroscience majors now and uh, which is uh, about 15% now of Loyola's undergraduate uh, so it's the second and the third largest majors uh, in the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, but uh, I was brought basically as a cognitive neuroscience to help develop a curriculum for a neuroscience major. And so I still teach a cognitive neuroscience class, which is kind of an upper divisional undergraduate lecture class. And I also teach a grad version of uh, that as well. Uh, a lot of what I do now is Direct, what I call directed at neuroscience literacy and career development. So trying to figure out, help the neuroscience majors in particular, figure out uh, how uh, they're going to make a living after they graduate um, or what they're going to do next. Um, I also do that in psychology through my undergraduate program director uh, hat. We've recently developed a career development psychology advising uh, class that's a part of that. And lastly, the class that's uh, my most fun to teach, I teach the psychology of creativity, which I originally developed at the School of the Art Institute as an adjunct when I was uh, postdocing. Um, and since I've gotten to teach that in our honors college, which are, uh, uh, well, they at least think they're smart undergraduate students, and, uh, and they come basically from just about every department major across the university in 36 students each time I uh, do it. Um, the service part is the undergraduate program director. And uh, we just redid the psychology major after 50 years. Yes, that was nice, uh, uh, quite up to date. Um, and, uh, and I spend a lot of time uh, recruiting faculty uh, adjuncts, part-timers, uh, non-tenure track uh, professors um, to teach at Loyola. And then what I was doing right before I came on this Zoom was on Zoom uh, doing advising. Um, I try uh, 
all of our faculty do some academic advising, and then we have a department that is supposed to be in charge of it uh, in the college. But uh, uh, but I get the hard questions uh, that I have to figure out. So anyway, you can see I have three pretty distinct hats, but I try to figure out how they can actually talk to each other um, uh, as much as possible. Okay, so this talk comes out of that intersection between things, and it's really built on this model. And the, the kind of the right-hand side of this thing, uh, can you guys see my arrow? Yeah. So the person, the behavior, right? That's psychology, basically, is that uh, people behave and they behave through some type of mental processes, uh, sometimes involving emotion or uh, some type of cognition, right? Um, and then we all know we all live in the world, right? We all live in a unique culture. And that culture has impact on us, both through what it thinks about our behavior, but it also directly uh, interacts on us about what it thinks about us as a person. Um, as a cognitive neuroscientist, I sort of, I'm a materialist, so I more or less replace person with brain um, there. But, uh, but nonetheless, you kind of uh, get the picture here that what's happening over on the right hand side of the screen is really dramatically impacted in a couple of different ways by what's happening over in green, okay? The second thing is when, as professors, we're trying obviously to get people to learn things, right? That's one of the things we're doing. And we, we're trying to get them to learn different types of things. So, uh, and it turns out that the brain also does these different types of learning. And interestingly enough, it does it with distinct networks. So you have like uh, experience learning, the fact that, you know, I can tell you that I had uh, Bob's special oatmeal for breakfast, um, or uh, I can tell you what I, more or less what I did yesterday. Um, I can also tell you when I got married and things like that, right? So that's uh, sometimes called episodic memory. Um, a second type of memory is uh, we, we would all call it knowledge or fact uh, information. That's frequently associated and talked about in terms of semantic memory. And that in, makes use of the episodic memory network, but it does different things as well. It doesn't care about when we learned those things. It's more general than that. And it kind of averages over lots of experiences to try to come up with some summation uh, of what we've actually learned. And lastly, we have skill learning. So things like driving a car, uh, I might add writing a decent English sentence uh, as well is a skill that I noticed a bunch of people are interested in uh, aspiring to someday read as a part of a student assignment. That would be awesome. Um, so, and that's a completely different brain network as a whole. But the thing about uh, teaching, right, is that to some extent you can hit all of these things at the same time. Every once in a while, a student actually remembers what you said in a particular class, uh, usually when you didn't mean to say that, right? And they'll remind you of that at an inopportune time. Um, so that's kind of that episodic uh, knowledge or episodic experience. You've got knowledge, so we're trying to cram that into their heads so that they can pass the test uh, in the end or presumably use that to do something useful in the future. And we probably are also trying to teach them skills as well, at least we should be, because those can be practical and transferable beyond this really weird thing that we do in college, which isn't really much like anything else. Um, so three kinds of learning. Um, you might have heard this turn talked about in terms of assimilation and accommodation, right? So we can put, uh, we basically believe that the brain is a very complex network uh, of neurons that have been connected to represent information. When we get new information, the job of sleep, among other things, is to try to figure out how that new information actually fits into the knowledge structures that we already have in our head. 
So things that are pretty similar to things that we already know go in easily. Things that are dissimilar don't, okay? Um, the second thing is the same is true for getting it out, right? Is that uh, when we're trying to go in and get things out of our head, it's the things that we've had lots of experiences to that are all pretty similar to each other that tend to come out more easily. But the reality is that a lot of learning isn't just that, right? It's actually rearranging what's in there. Um, it's not just fitting stuff into where it goes, but actually trying to restructure it into new, really truly new knowledge as well. That's the hard part, right? But the, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today really is more about that first part is how do you get them engaged in the first place? How do you get new learning to fit in to make any sense with what they already know about the world? And that's really kind of where the diversity issue comes, right? Because their culture in a lot of cases is very different than our culture. Um, if nothing less, as we get older, you're all very aware, I'm sure, of trying to stay cool and trying to stay up with them. And it's honestly a losing battle, right? So in one way or another, we need to try to find ways so that they can bring their cultural reality to meet the things that we would like them to actually learn. The last thing that I'll say by way of theory is it's just kind of one of my favorite terms. Uh, so there's this cognitive psychologist, Endel Tolving, um, who's famous about talking about the human prefrontal cortex as a vehicle for mental time travel. And he says that with his bow tie uh, as provocatively as, uh, as he possibly can. But literally what he means is that the human frontal lobe, which I didn't show this part of the slide, is just takes up an enormous piece of real estate in our brains compared to any other animal, most every other animal um, on the planet. It's really what's uh, anatomically distinct about us as humans is that we have just this giant prefrontal cortex. And it appears that basically what prefrontal cortex does is it allows us to have a rich experience of the conscious present, but it also allows us to mind wander, meaning that we can go back and savor the past former experiences, and we can also imagine the future. Um, which is something that we don't really believe many other animals actually do. They're just living in this current moment um, with kind of automated uh, learning patterns for their past learning. In contrast, we can have this rich conscious experience going backwards and forwards. And of course, we all know that when we have the students in class, uh, trying to create this super rich conscious present, they actually are just spending all their time thinking about what they did last night or imagining uh, what bar they're going to go to uh, tonight, right? Um, and psychologists now have a name for that. It's mind wandering. And it turns out that it uses the same machinery that, uh, you know, our memory system and imagination system use for pretty much anything. And interestingly, it works in opposition to the conscious present. So we have this uh, conscious present here, which theoretically for a moment of time turns off that going past, uh, going past and future. Um, but then when we go past and future, it turns off the conscious past, right? So this is also one of the challenges that all of us uh, face um, in the classroom as well. But I might add that that interaction, we also believe is what really allows humans to be creative among other things. So it's not a bad thing in and of itself. You just have to think about how you're gonna harness it. So kind of putting all these together, I wanna take just a couple of minutes and talk about a couple of assignments that I've used across different classes that were kind of designed to try to build these different types of learning 
but also do that in a way that students can actually interact with their world to try to incorporate the new information that they're picking up in class. I don't think any of these are going to be truly new uh, to you, but I'll kind of talk them, uh, talk you through them. And then uh, we can have a little bit of a discussion about how some of this stuff might be applied to the types of things that you try to teach, if you like, or I can answer any other questions that you want. So the overall objective here, right, was to integrate new learning into their lived experience. So realizing that they know about stuff and they have had personal experiences in the past that are probably bound within a certain cultural context for them. And it might be one that I don't know much about, okay? And that has two benefits to it if we're successful to do that. One is that uh, it allows us, the assignments to reinvent themselves, right? We don't have to try to keep up current with their culture. They bring the culture to us and actually instantiate the learning that we're trying to get them to do in their cultural context. So it has the benefit of keeping new. Um, I've done uh, at least one of these assignments for 12 years now at Loyola. And the things that the students talk about now are not the things they talked about five years ago, are not the things they talked about 10 years ago, but I go with it, right? They take me along for that ride, which turns out to be really interesting for the most part. Um, the second is that it gives student autonomy. You've probably heard this before, but trying to give them control over their assignments to some extent is a good thing. And the reason that it's a good thing is that you have a greater likelihood of engaging their intrinsic interest in something other than just holding what we all have over their heads, which is the extrinsic grades, right? Um, among other things, if you wanna encourage people to be creative, you have to basically push the accelerator on both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. So trying to get them to spend time on things that they actually enjoy doing or enjoy thinking about is going to be your friend um, in that case. So, you know, trying to get them to use those culturally relevant lived experiences as source is, uh, will hopefully uh, uh, cause both of those things to happen. The other thing that all of these assignments were due, uh, were designed for, is for them to be doing it not just for the instructor, okay? Um, half of this is because I'm lazy, right? Uh, we all know how much we enjoy uh, grading at the end of the semester, or in the case of Dr. Litwicky, seemingly constantly. Um, and, uh, and so part of this was to get to a point where I could use peer evaluation among other things, but it was also based on an article that I read some time ago that where an English, it was actually an English composition professor studied uh, having people write blogs versus having them write term papers. And basically what they found is that the quality of the, uh, what they wrote was much better when they were writing for the blog than when they were writing the term paper. And they kind of dug into why that was. And it basically appeared to be peer pressure. Um, you know, if you're writing for this paper for this uh, woman or man that you're never going to see ever again, right? They're just going to give you your minimal grade and you're going to get out of their life. And that's that you don't really care. You just care that it's good enough to get out, right? But if you're writing something that basically is going to be potentially seen thousands of times, um, or maybe actually be seen by other people whose opinion you might care about, then that acts as an incentive to not embarrass yourself. Um, so, uh, so all of these have some type of a public dimension to them. So either a, a public presentation 
or they're going out into the inner tubes uh, for lots of people to see. And I'll give you some data on how many other people actually see it. All right. Oops, slide broken. Um, so here are the three things I'm going to talk about real briefly. The first is a blog assignment that I do in a neuroscience seminar class. And I'll tell you what that class is in a second. The second one is the students work together in a group to make a narrative video. Um, and that happens in a cognitive and behavioral neuroscience class. Um, and the third one is that they do a, a primary uh, research project and that ends in a group presentation. And that's in my psychology of creativity class. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna briefly tell you kind of what the objectives of each of those classes are, and then a little bit about what that assignment is, and then we're done. Okay, so the neuroscience seminar, it's basically directed at helping the students appreciate um, uh, how neuroscience scientists ask and answer questions. And we do that through a kind of traditional research uh, seminar. Um, and secondar secondarily, I want them to think about why does any of this matter? Um, so I, I start that class by saying, I tell a story about when I was an undergraduate student and I, sometimes, and I was a biology chemistry major many years ago, I sometimes think that my greatest accomplishment was actually explaining how recombinant DNA technology worked to my great aunt, who was 85 at the time and didn't uh, ever uh, go to college. Um, and, uh, and I could tell based on the questions that she asked that she got it, right? And so one of the objectives that we have for scientists at Loyola who are graduating is that regardless of where they find themselves vocationally, that they'll be advocates for science, um, that they'll be ready to give science away, that when they, they're at the coffee pot in the morning, don't we wish we get to go back to the coffee pot someday, right? Um, and they're talking with their colleagues and somebody's talking about some news item that uh, just came up, that they'll be able to set them straight about how to actually interpret the science or help that person understand how science actually works. So that's a big objective here. And so that is one of the things that motivates the blog. So basically what the students do in the class is I bring in a different researcher in uh, every week. Now with Zoom, it's kind of fun because I can bring them in from all over the world. Um, and they give a traditional hour research talk. Um, before that happens, they share a, uh, a published paper and the students have to read that paper and write a discussion question about it, which they submit. So that introduces them to the topic, kind of scaffolds it, the experience so that it's a little easier for them to understand the talk. But that's all kind of a pretty dry seminar-like experience. Um, during the course of the 13 talks for the semester, they go for the full range of uh, neuroscience, all the way from cell molecular up to behavioral neurologists and all the way in between. And just to give you an idea, these students are sophomores to seniors. Uh, they've had an intro to neuroscience class. That's the only prerequisite. So it's a stretch for them. Uh, reading from the primary literature, many of it for many of them, it's the first time they've done it. Um, and listening to science talks is basically how scientists learn things. Um, and so it's a super important skill that honestly, almost no college and universities put into their undergraduate curriculum. And that's a shame because it is, we don't learn things from textbooks in the real world. We listen to listening to other people talk about them and reading their papers. Um, so that brings up me to uh, the More Brain Points blog. Uh, if anybody's uh, tech savvy, you can actually scan it there, but it's uh, literally morebrainpoints.blogspot.com. Uh, so that's one thing to note is that it is public. It is not on Blackport or Sakai in our case, uh, in some kind of blog that people from only the class 
can see. It goes out to the public world. I make them sign up for uh, an author account to that blog. Um, and then they have to post twice to that. Um, if you want to see what some of them write, you can go and, and check that um, check that out. The, the assignment is basically to choose one topic, so a talk or a paper, and then to connect that to something in the outside world. So I give them uh, a lot of news services to look at. Occasionally, they wimp out and connect it to another uh, paper in the, uh, the research literature. But the encouragement really is that something from your personal life, something from uh, that you're reading or hearing about in the news, how does this thing um, relate to that? You can see in this case, the student was uh, taking a language talk and then talking about how, why, why the heck can't anyone pronounce their name correctly um, and, uh, and applying that. So in that way, the student really made this personal um, to them. And the intent is not to write it like a term paper, but rather to write it in a way that it would be generally interesting to the general public. So that kind of gets at this connecting uh, my knowledge as a scientist to uh, giving that away to the general public. Uh, and yes, it is public. Uh, so this blog has uh, over 200,000 views uh, now. Just last month, it got hit uh, 2,500 times. Um, I'll say that uh, it is by far far the biggest uh, exposure of neuroscience uh, at Loyola University to the world, literally, that this is the public face of the university. I show them those statistics on the first day of class. I tell them to please, please, please invite your mom to uh, read the blog because they always want to know what they're doing at college. Well, tell them what you're doing at college. You don't have to take the time to explain it. They can take a look and uh, see it. So all of that is kind of emphasizing the fact that it's not just the professor that's gonna read this, but your classmates are gonna read this. The rest of the world, when they're doing a Google search, might come across your article as well. Um, I don't do that in this class, but I use a blogging assignment in another class, and we actually do kind of forced commenting within the class. In that class, they blog three times during the course of the semester, and each week, a third of the class is blogging, and everyone has to put up at least one comment on something that's been going. So that, again, encourages this idea that people other than just the Tierra, the instructor, are going to read it um, and makes it uh, public. Okay, so the next one is this narrative video thing. Uh, this comes out of the company that Mark mentioned during my intro, which was called Sunasis, that I started with a mutual friend of Mark's and mine, uh, Chad Eric Bergman, who's a theater professor. And our intent was to develop narrative stories, either in theater or in film, that could be used as bridges to ideas in science. Um, and so we did a short narrative film, among other things, on uh, kind of the fallibility of human memory, among other things. Um, and so, and I and I did that company because I really believe that. Um, pulling people into stories, stories about their own life, stories about other people's lives is a really effective way to kind of illustrate points that we're trying to make uh, in the classroom. And so this assignment basically was an acknowledgement about the fact that the most effective stories would be their own stories. It wouldn't be the ones that some education programmer actually created. Um, so in this class, it's a traditional textbook uh, class. So they have a big, you know, textbook that weighs more than their brain. Um, and uh, I droll on in traditional lectures, which I try to fill with interesting stories from my life. 
Um, and usually they stay awake. Uh, every once in a while, I have one that hits the floor. You know, we put those guardrails up on the side on their chairs. So when they go too far, it catches them before they actually get a concussion. Um, but nonetheless, it's a pretty dry class. It's not real active. It's too big to be uh, effectively active. Um, but what we do then is that we get them into small groups and they actually put together a plot for a narrative story that they tell uh, through film. And, uh, and their only assignment along with that is they have to pick some topic from the class that they're gonna use to build into that story that it's gonna give some structure. So the film uh, that I uh, edited just to do a little reel like this uh, up above was one that was about Adderall addiction. Uh, I remember one year I had eight final films in the class and three of them were about Adderall. Uh, so those of you that don't know, Adderall is an ADHD drug that students will use to try to heighten attention. Uh, it's uh, pre-cocaine in medical school, basically. Um, uh, maybe less dangerous for your brain than uh, cocaine is, fortunately. Um, but nonetheless, uh, particularly the pre-med students buy this stuff and abuse it. I had no idea, right? So that's one thing that came out as after the third one of these is like, wait a minute, time out talk to me, what's going on? So in that moment, they were teaching me about the reality of their culture that they were uh, in that is really useful. And now it's something I can incorporate into lectures because I know that's a part of their lived uh, experience. The most creative uh, Adderall film, uh, my favorite one was that uh, they basically, it was a crime drama and they had busted an Adderall ring and they were smuggling in placebo Adderall into the ring and looking for people who were going through withdrawal symptoms to snag the people who were Adderall addicts. Um, it was an incredible use of the information because they kind of thought about all the way through what was the mechanism, what happened to you, uh, and the like. So there was a lot of learning that kind of went on in building that story and making it convincing. Um, and uh, it was fun to watch. So we, we do a film festival. So I don't give a final exam during the final exam period of the class. Instead, we have a public screening of all the films that have made. They all have to post them to YouTube. So they're out in the public. So when I wanted to grab this one uh, last night, I just Googled Psych 382 uh, in uh, YouTube uh, and uh, grabbed it right up. Um, so it's public, it's out there. Um, their whole class is watching it. So again, they're, you, know, you wanna do a good job because everyone else is, uh, is watching. Uh, I, I've done this assignment, I think maybe for about eight times now uh, in that uh, class. And uh, it's always a fun time uh, in the end to watch them. And uh, the students report that they uh, really enjoy doing them. In fact, uh, there was supposedly a party that happened once to record their movie because they had like 30 extras uh, in it and uh, did it. So it was, uh, you know, a, an assignment that they were intrinsically motivated um, to do. Okay, and the last one is in my Psych of Creativity class. And uh, this class is not a textbook lecture class. Um, it's a very mixed media focused class. Uh, we watch films, we watch pieces of films. In its current incarnation, I pre-record some short lectures that they have to watch out of class. And then each class, one group has to come in and actually give my lecture in 10 minutes. Um, so they're the ones that actually present the information so that we make sure that the other uh, uh, six sevenths of the class that probably didn't watch the lecture because it was asynchronous uh, has actually watched it. 
Um, there are no tests or quizzes in the class. It's all project-based learning and blogging. Um, the objective of the class is basically twofold. One is to expose them to contemporary psychology, neuroscience, and sociology theory on uh, creativity. Um, and the second one, which I tell them up front, is because uh, what human beings do is really amazing. And the greatest gift that I could give to them for the rest of their lives is just to, to keep their eyes open and watch what incredible things people do. And so a big piece of it is during that semester, just paying attention to the novel and uh, original things that uh, human beings do and kind of delight in it. Um, so that's a big piece. So I share a lot of stuff from film and audio and the like. Um, we do a lot of active learning in class, so that was particularly challenging during Zoom. Uh, lots of breakout rooms, obviously. Sometimes we played games. Uh, now we, I physically, I actually get, I teach it at night, and I get uh, a lecture hall where there aren't many classes, so that we can literally take over the whole building during the course of the class. So they move around and uh, spread. So physically active uh, learning, not just engaged. And, this, and the last thing is, and this is a big piece of this class, is honing your skills of how to work in a group. Um, when I was not in academia, and also while I was in academia, most of what I do is actually working with other people. And I think for a lot of them, that's their going to be their uh, experience when they get out into the real world. And so we actually talk about some group dynamics and uh, how to get the most out of a group, how to problem solve when somebody's not pulling their weight, um, and things like that. So that's another objective of the class. And so this assignment that they do in here is basically the second major group project in the class. They have to identify one person in the outside world that they think is really creative. The mirror by the door was the mirror by the And they have to do a primary interview of that person and some people around that person to understand the person's culture. Um, they do that interview based on information from the class. We do give them a structured interview that is was a four-hour interview. They don't do four-hour interviews, so they have to pick out what was interesting to them from that. And then they have to craft an active learning presentation. So they have 30 minutes of, uh, of class time to basically share this person's life and work with the class incorporating uh, uh, content from the class, including about the person's creative um, process. Um, obviously, integrating course content is a special part of that. It's part of the grading rubric for it. And it's group work. They're in groups of five, and they have to figure out how to do this uh, together. Um, so you can see we've uh, we've gotten some famous people in the past to agree to do this. Uh, I didn't know who Chance the Rapper was when somebody talked Chance into doing an interview. Uh, he it was not that long out of Jones College Prep at the time, so it was a little easier to get than he would be now. Um, but uh, but I'm also proud to say that the group has discovered people who basically went on to be national celebrities or in their fields afterwards, um, which is really exciting. In many cases, identifying them before that happens. Um, and they do this in all different walks of life. So the guy up above, some of you may have seen him on the evening news before, Jim uh, Batcher is a mosaic artist. He runs a mosaic school that's near Loyola. He's done the, a bunch of the CTA uh, stops in mosaics, including Thorndale, um, which is near Loyola's campus. And so that's how they knew about him. His most famous project is he goes around the city of Chicago filling potholes with mosaics. Um, he does a different series every year. You can go out uh, and do a bike trip with him and he'll cycle through 
a year's uh, series with you so that you can see it. Um, and that's what he did with the students. Literally, their interview was cycling around the city uh, with him out to see the potholes that he uh, made. Um, uh, Tommy uh, Mangies is a, a game developer. Um, uh, uh, Tanika Johnson is now a social activist, a photographer, uh, now uh, has had uh, museum shows across uh, uh, the country, but she was basically, no one much knew her before the students discovered her, um, which was kind of cool. Theaster Gates is a big uh, community organizer and conceptual artist uh, on the city south side. So there's been, uh, I've done this thing, I'm on my 11th time now, and I've had seven projects uh, each time. And uh, it is amazing to see who the students bring back and the stories that they tell uh, as a result of the experience. Um, I think uh, the bonding that happens amongst the students, I see clusters of them who became friends in the class and continue on social media for years after they graduate. So I think this is a fantastic thing that many of us could do uh, in our classes organized around whatever topics that uh, we were um, doing. So anyway, uh, that's it for me. Sorry, uh, talk so much. Um, uh, the link on the left is to get my faculty page if you want to contact me. If you, for some reason you want these slides, that's the one on the right. Uh, but I'd be uh, glad to answer any questions or hear what uh, you guys think, or I'd also be willing to talk about uh, how any of those assignments might be able to fit into uh, what you teach, too. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, we'll open the floor for questions here. Not everybody at once. I just have a very simple, like a technical oh. question, but I was just wondering about like the, how you're finding when, when the students, and thanks, thanks by the way, great, great information. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, when the students start to make the video, are, do you, is there, is there a, like a place you send them? They're probably technology skills way beyond mine, most of the Yeah, students so are. when I was on the job market at, a, the first time back around 2006 or thereabouts, I was interviewing at lots of um, liberal arts colleges then. And I talked about, you know, what I was doing with Sunesis and things while I was there. And I would ask them, hey, do you have any kind of like, if students wanted to make movies, you know, uh, is there some way for them to do that? And I was surprised to find a lot of schools at that time had some kind of digital media lab so that they could get equipment and there was like workstations that they could do this. And I was thinking, oh, you know, but boy, it's gonna be a lot of trouble because I'm gonna have to teach them Final Cut Pro or iMovie or something like that, you know, and everything. Well, uh, there's this guy, it was Steve Jobs. And uh, I think he invented this thing called the smartphone, right? And the smartphone takes video. And uh, uh, raise of hands, who's been on TikTok, uh, right? So, and this was 2009 when I started. So the re revolution hadn't hit yet, but uh, they, and Loyola has that resource. So if they wanted to check out a camera, they could. But most of these things are cut on an iPhone or a smartphone. Some of them never even leave the smartphone. Literally, they're doing the editing uh, on the phone. Um, does everybody in a group of five know how to do that? Well, now, actually, probably the answer is yes. But I guarantee you that two or three of them will be pretty good at it. Um, so I haven't had to do anything in the entire history of that project with that. I was prepared to because of my background. I actually knew how to do those things, but it was it's amazing. Right. Um, and now, honestly, you know, uh, if you really wanted to be hip, you wouldn't have them post it to YouTube. You'd have them put it up on TikTok or Reels or something like that. 
um, yeah. to maybe do a couple of them and keep them real short, being sensitive to what the format of those media are. And if, uh, if they have any trouble with it, they should just consult with their 13 year old niece or nephew. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, no, early on, that was absolutely true, is that uh, there was at least a 13 year old sibling that cut one early on, um, which uh, is, you know, pretty fascinating. But the students have definitely in terms of the tech and everything, I've seen a definite change even in the last 12 years. And it's nice, too, because even uh, low income students typically have a smartphone. Um, they might not have a laptop or anything like that. And, and Morton might not have the resources for them, uh, you know, for video editing or something like that. But honestly, it can be done just on a smartphone. Randy, you had a question. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, hi, Bob. I teach um, hi. comp in the English department, and I really love your idea about moving papers to a blog format so students know their audience. Um, my one question is, did you notice any difficulty with getting students to adhere to, let's say more professional tone and word choice in the blog format? Because um, we would still be expecting them to maintain sure. those um, criteria for a rhetoric class. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, that is a potential problem. Um, so one of the things that I do is I tend to share some blogs with them early on to give them examples of what I'm talking about. Now, so one benefit of the public blog is they, they ask me, so how long does it need to be? And I say, how many thousand prior examples of this assignment do you need? Um, because literally everything that's ever been done in the class is on that blog, right? Mm -hmm. So they can see lots of examples of uh, what's expected. Um, we also give them links to, uh, to A uh, blogs in the past so that they can uh, take a look at that. And we literally will just uh, link to prior um, examples for that. Um, but I give them great blogs. Um, my favorite is, uh, I don't know whether any of you have ever seen, it's, it actually changed its name recently, and I don't remember, but it was Brain Pick Pickings um, is one of my favorite blogs. And it's brilliantly written, and it's about creativity. Um, but I'll give them a couple of examples of different bloggers like that so they can see that these people aren't writing in, they're not writing like they text. Right. Um, which is what we really want to avoid. Um, but, you know, in an English composition class, I wish I could say, yeah, you could just do blogs, right? No, obviously you can't, right? right? They need to learn different types of writing. But I think this is a good one uh, to get them. And maybe it's a good one, a, a starter assignment to kind of get them into it, to realize that, oh, writing can be fun. And then you guys probably give them some autonomy, I would guess, on choosing topics to write about uh, in some case going forward. And they just have to learn the different formats then. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we, I always actually have a challenge with that, you know, giving them that autonomy to choose topics. I mean, some <laughs> of them, yeah, okay, I'm going to do something I'm interested in. And I tell them, do something you're interested in. But you always have a couple that, their topic that they decide to write on is the example you gave them, <laughs> you know, and it's like, right, right. Well, what a coincidence that that example was your. Yeah, that, that kind of reminds me of the whole, uh, the grading by rubric problem too. It's sort of like, you know, it's like, all right, well, you need to do this and you need to do this and you need to do this. Right. And they do that and they do that and they do that and they forgot that it was supposed to be a story, right? Or something. So there's this compartmentalization. Um, and so that that's certainly a, a problem, like even with giving examples is, there's some students that you give them that intrinsic thing and they're off to the races with it. They know exactly what they're gonna be doing. And there are other ones that you kind of have to lead them to the water um, to go. and. I mean, that's not, that's not your fault, right? 
Um, one of my students in my lab and I were just texting earlier today. She's a big gamification person. So she's an education major at Loyola and she's all about turning things uh, in education into games. And we frequently uh, joust about this. And, and we were talking about the intrinsic extrinsic ratio. So intrinsic emotion, uh, motivation being things you just love to do, period, right? So Mark on his bike, for instance. Um, or, uh, you know, then there are the things that you're doing for some reward. So like a grade or money or whatever. And I've long hypothesized that each person has an intrinsic extrinsic ratio in their lives. And the art is that in a classroom, you probably have people that are all across that ratio, right? There are some people, they are not going to do it unless they like doing it. There are other people that will absolutely do it for an A. They don't care what you do. And you can see this in real life too, um, you know, out in jobs as well. There are some people that will do anything to make a lot of money and they don't care what the 50 hours or 60 hours a week that they're doing to do that. You make me do stuff that I don't like to do and I'm just gonna die. You know, like I don't care much about money, but I do care about um, you know, being able to spend my time in things that I enjoy. So I think trying to craft these assignments so that there's a balance between the intrinsic and extrinsic there um, so that you can try to find a sweet spot for you know your whole class but it's never perfect well i think that brings us up to 58 minutes after the hour so um we'll have if to anybody call it a day. if anybody does want information about like the rubrics that we use grading rubrics that we use for any of these feel free to just zap me an email and uh i'll uh send that your way all right well thanks everyone for joining us today and especially thank you to dr morrison for that presentation um We'll sign off now, so take care, everybody. Thanks for your attention.